Hi, Fitz Dog Radio host Greg Fitzsimmons. Back from, ah, it's gone for a week. That's a lot. I usually go away for like three days. I leave on a Thursday. I come back on a Sunday morning in time for football. This week it was a uh, vacation mixed with some work. I went off to Nashville with uh, Mike Gibbons, who went and stayed at his girlfriend's house, had a blast. Uh, never been to Nashville in my life and kind of fell in love with it. I liked the, uh, we played golf. We went to, um, oh my God, the Ryman, the Ryman Auditorium. That alone is worth going to Nashville. It's the most insane. The sound is so amazing. It's a it's an old church that was converted, and so it still has the pews. It has this wooden ceiling, and something about it. The sound is just so crisp and resonant that uh, it just takes the concert to a whole other level. We saw two different shows there. The first night we saw uh, Wheeler Walker, who's got a new album that you should check out immediately. It's on Spotify. And his band is All Star. They are some of the best musicians in Nashville. If you don't know Wheeler Walker, check him out. It's country music done by a friend of ours, me and Mike's. Mike is actually developing a show with him right now. So he goes and sees him in Nashville a lot. But, um, but it, it's it's a parody of country music, but it's also incredibly good musically. And uh, <laughs> one of his new songs is about sitting in the front row of a strip club or what you call Sniffer's Row. So I'm sitting down here on Sniffer's Row, catching me a whiff of that camel toe, see some B's and D's and a couple of C-section scars, there's a DJ playing bad rock and roll, p- pussy juice dripping down the stripper's pole. Life is lonely when you're sitting on Sniffer's Row. Yeah, baby. Uh, great show. It was so funny seeing women. Women love Wheeler Walker as much as men. I saw women singing every word to his songs. And then uh, this woman comes running up the aisle with some tiggle bitties. Pulls her shirt up and uh, flashes everybody, uh, runs up and down. It was hilarious. And then later on, uh, a bouncer was throwing a guy out and he took a swing at him. I mean, it was real like good old Southern entertainment. And then the next night we went back and saw Jason Isbell. And if you know me, you know that I am not uh, an old time country fan. I've recently tried to get into country music, possibly because of Gibbons' girlfriend, and she's introduced me to some good stuff. You guys have been kind enough to reach out and tell me some artists that I've found that I've liked. But uh, but Jason Isbell is the one that really has always struck a chord with me. And we saw him, and he did his album. It's called uh, Southeast. It's about 10 years old. I think it was the 10-year anniversary, actually. And he does um, he does a whole, like, 10-day 10, 10 run at the Ryman every October. So we caught him on one of those shows. And, uh, man, his lyrics hit hard. Uh, it stuck with me for a couple days. There's that one song about uh, how she sang in the shower, and it was stuck in my head. And it made me think about Erin because she whistles. My wife whistles around the house. And they're not even always songs. Sometimes they're just like melodies. And my son gets annoyed. And I say, you hold your tongue, son. Mom's whistling because mom's happy. And I love it. It, it makes me so happy that uh, that she she's found something. She's a doula now. And... I kind of feel like she found her calling and she's just never been happier. So I uh, I always think like if God forbid she died, like I would that's the thing I would I would think about. I think about her whistling around the house. Maybe I should make a recording of it. Like bird sounds. In case she gets uh the big C. What if she gets the big C? I shouldn't even say it out loud. But it happens. Oh boy does it happen. 
Um, then we went to the Museum of Country, which was really cool. Um, and again, like I'm not, I knew way more about country than I thought I did. And like Johnny Cash and yeah, I knew I knew Willie Nelson and all that stuff, but like I was shocked about how many of the old dudes that I that I kind of remember. And uh, and there was a drunk lady who was who kept following us and talking to us, and she she had alcohol in her breath. She was about sixty five, if not seventy, probably seventy, and she was talking about the concerts that she's been to and. Uh, and, and she's like, yeah, I was at fucking, I don't remember which concert she was saying, but like, I was just trying to get away from it. I was like, look, I've been a concert. I was at the Stanley Cup finals. How about that? Do you want to hear about that? Cause I don't want to hear about your fucking Willie Nelson concert from the eighties. Who cares? Let, let, let me get back to learning about how Conway Twitty was a felon. Cause that's interesting. Let me look at Elvis's car. Elvis had a Cadillac there that. Um, had big ass fins on it and the, it was a convertible, no, not a convertible, a hard top. And it had something like a hundred coats of paint and there were diamonds ground up in the paint. And it had this incredible like pearl white sheen to it. Uh, it was pretty wild. And he had like a hundred of these cars. He used to give people cars all the time. That dude made so much money. I read a book about him recently and all from like music that, you know, some argue wasn't his, but anyone would argue was not great. It was not great music. I mean, name, name five great Elvis songs. You know, I can't help falling in love with you is great. Um, blue suede shoes is great. Um, But again, like, I don't even know which of these are his. You know, a lot of them are covers of old blues standards. Um, uh, Hunk of Burn and Love. I'm sure that was his. That was a piece of shit song. And then the movies, name name two. Name two Elvis movies. He made dozens. I mean, there was a lot of output with him. But really what he's famous for is being him. That he was beautiful. He was cool to his fucking core. He was an incredibly generous, decent, kind, loving person. Um, but it was, and he was the first, one of the first rock and rollers of all time. So he had balls to, to you know, he went headlong into that genre, helped create it. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of like, there was a lot of guys who looked like Elvis. There was a lot of like older dudes with balding, but the hair was blow dried back with a little grease in it. Uh, there was a lot of flip flops. I don't like to see a man in flip flops at all. A lot of Hawaiian shirts, which is uh, I call the Hawaiian shirt the varsity jersey for alcoholism. And yeah, it. And then we come, we came out of the museum, and I saw this. There's a big lawn in front, and I saw this. Uh, the, not not in front, around the corner, and there was a, a lady with her little toddler, and the toddler was playing with an acorn, and the mom was bent over, and I thought, what a sweet moment they're having. And then I looked around, and she's got a fucking video camera, out and she's videotaping the kid. Just take the kid in. Can you do that? Can you just be? Is that possible? I mean, how much more intimacy do you need to divulge on fucking TikTok? Just, what else are we supposed to show? What's next? Sex? Here's, I mean, we're supposed to be as personal as possible on social media. Let people in. Here's me fucking. How about that? Why don't they allow that? How about here's my, here's my uncle in his coffin. And I'm getting a selfie with him. Here's the shit I took yesterday. Here's a rash. Here's a rash on my foreskin. Okay, you guys want to see it? You guys want you guys want to chat about it? What's the line? I post pictures of me with people I care about. Uh, I try to do some shout out videos for my shows. I don't know. I'm not good at it. I'm clearly awful at it because I haven't picked up new followers in a year. 
I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I took I took a picture. Uh, I was in D.C. after Nashville, and uh, Santino called me. They were doing a big theater. I'm doing a 200 seater in the suburbs, and they're doing a fucking 4,000 seater downtown. So I went to have lunch with uh, Santino and Jet Ski, old Jet Ski, and uh, Bobby Lee swung by for a little bit. We hung around the White House. We stood in front of the White House. There was a lot of like uh, men in black looking dudes just milling about. There was like crazy homeless people, schizophrenic, out of their minds people, and then guys that were clearly on an earpiece looking for trouble. And I might have said some things that, they, that I wanted them to overhear and tackle us, but they didn't hear us. Um, all my cousins came out to my show in DC. I got my, I talk about Danny McCarthy, my cousin that, uh, is the pro golfer. So his parents came out, Dennis and Elena, and then the brothers were there. Uh, Kevin was there, Colleen and Colleen's husband, Bill, and uh, a couple of friends that they had with them. And then, um, my cousin Terry Ann and her husband, Bob drove like two and a half hours from Richmond to come hang out. They got a hotel room for the night. And then my friends, John and Patty drove in and then we did the shows. I think I was a little filthy. My cousins are a little more conservative than I am. And I don't know if I shocked them. I hopefully I didn't shock them, but, uh, and then me and Terry Ann and Bob went to an Irish bar afterwards with John and Patty and a couple other people. And there was a band playing, rock and band playing some Leonard Skinner and I hung out with my cousins. It was great. Great night. Um, and I'm back. I'm back. Both kids are out tonight. Probably threw a move on the wife. See how that goes. Uh, what do we got? Um, dates come Oh, by the way, holidays coming up. Don't forget your Grapefruit Simmons t-shirts. Available at fitzdog.com. If you didn't get them last Christmas, got a couple left. Yeah. Warehouse is calling me saying, hey, we got to move these shirts. They're cheap and they're good quality. Also, speaking of cheap, I will be performing in Houston at the Riot on November 3rd and 4th. Bakersfield, California at the Well, November 11th. Austin, Texas at the Mothership, recording my special November 17th to the 19th. San Francisco at the Punchline, November 30th through December 2nd. Also coming to Fort Worth, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia. And we just announced uh, La Jolla in San Diego. Tickets at FitzDog.com. Also want to tell you if you want to buy tickets for other things, Game Time is a great way to go. It is a way for you to not stress out about buying tickets. You chill out and keep an eye on some shows. Prices always dip, and that's where they help you save money. They have these flash deals. They have last minute things. Right now I'm looking at the Jonas Brothers for $41, if that interests you. Um, Jackson Brown is playing tonight. I wish I wasn't so tired I would go. Um, and those tickets are 60 bucks. Travis Scott for 60 bucks at SoFi Stadium. So you can see what's in your area. You can watch the, the prices go down. You can look at your seat. What's the view from the seat? You can look at that on the app. The app is sweet. Couple taps. You got your tickets. You don't have to download. You don't have to transfer. You don't have to print. It's all right there. I've used it. It's simple. Um, uh, and it is, there's a guarantee if you find uh, tickets in the same section in a row for the same night, they will refund you 110% of the difference. And uh, that's it. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code FITSDOG for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code F-I-T-Z-D-O-G for $20 off. Download, download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Also, some tickets you might want to buy are for sports. If you're an NBA fan, the wait is over. Basketball is back. And DraftKings Sportsbook, which is an official sports betting partner of the NBA, 
is celebrating with an unbeatable offer. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets for throwing down $5 on the WNBA. WNBA, NBA, did I say WNBA? <laughs> Maybe you want to bet on WNBA. Uh, what's the bet? The uh, How long it'll last? I shouldn't say that. Who knows? But it doesn't matter if you win or you lose. You're going to start the season with an instant dub. Uh, everybody's got a bigger shot. Everybody's got a great shot. Um, string together multiple bets from the same game or build your parlay across multiple games for a shot at making your payday even sweeter. Basketball is more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code Greg Fitz, G-R-E-G-F-I-T-Z. New customers can get $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting just $5. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code Greg Fitz. The crown is yours. Hey, you got a gambling problem? Call 800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net in New York. Call 877-8-HOPE-NEW-YORK or text hope new York 467 369 In Connecticut, help is available for, for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort. Licensed partner, Golden Nugget Lake Charles. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. All right. That was a mouthful. My guest today is a guy I've had on before who's a great comic. He just had a new album come out. He's touring like a madman. Uh, he's got a podcast called Time Suck. He's got a, he's got like three. Uh, I, I forget what they're all called. I think we talk about them on the podcast. But I had a great talk with him last week. I hope you enjoy this kickback. Crack open an iced tea and enjoy Dan Cummins. <laughs> Yo, welcome to Fitz Dog Radio in studio. <laughs> a guy who uh, I've never met you in person before, but no. you ha- you came on my podcast via Zoom. I think it was during the uh, uh, what was it twenty twenty COVID? When was COVID? Twenty yeah. twenty? Yeah, I think it was mid late twenty twenty something yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, and you were in Idaho. <laughs> yeah. Like a survivor, like a man. <laughs> yeah, Northern Idaho. It's a, yeah, fa- family brought us there. It wasn't yeah. a, it wasn't a career move for sure, uh-huh. but uh, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Do you feel more manly when you're there when you're, than when you're in like Los Angeles? I, I think I might feel less manly uh, in Coeur d'Alene just because like the guys are just bigger in general. Yeah. It's uh, I, I was talking to some other guys about this recently. Where I was in, I was in New York, and they're like, they were like, "Oh man, you're like a manly guy," and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah like manly for L.A. or manly, for, but like right, average, right. where I'm, where I'm from." Yeah, and it's like, you know, like I'll blow people's minds maybe in the comedy world that I uh, own guns or something like that, but it's like, yeah, a few, but again, where I, it's like I'm not going to the range all the time. I'm not. It's like I'm still like man light for Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Do they carry guns? Yeah, quite a bit. Like, yeah. can you hide? What, what is it called? What were the different things like? Oh, like concealed. concealed concealed weapons. Yeah, you can um, open carry uh, in Idaho. I don't even think you have to have. I don't. I don't even th- think you have to have a permit for it. You have to have a permit, I believe, for concealed. I, you know, I don't even know the the nuance because I know there are classes to go get your like concealed carry. I think permit it's called. But I also know like other people who have never taken that class and they just it, you ever it, get like shot? a surprise. No, never get shot. Actually, there's no uh, very little violence. It's one of those things where like a lot of guns, but very little crime, very little violence. Yeah, I, I think there's we're right by Spokane. <laughs> my, my theory is like you, Coeur d'Alene is just known as a place that is just loaded to the gills with guns. Like it's yeah. just a big hunting area and just and it's kind of like prepper and definitely some people who are psych, you know. Uh, psychopaths about it. Right. And I think it's like known enough where if you're somebody who's going to break into somebody's house, 
or somebody's car, you would literally have to have a death wish. Yeah. To try that. Right. In Coeur d'Alene. Like, no, I'll go to Spokane. Right. I'll, I'll just, and Spokane has a lot of crime. Right. So <laughs> yeah. how does that step out in turn? Because I'm not, I'm like you. I have more questions than answers, and I yeah. hope that I am a work in progress. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I hope that a conversation with somebody from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, can maybe uh, inform me a little bit. Because yeah. there's always, there, both sides are always trying to cherry pick uh, data and say, yes. well, you know, these states have open carry and there's less right. crime. And then, other, and then the blue media will say, well, no, actually, there's more crime in these red states. But like, hmm, how, yeah. do, how do you step out gun ownership versus um, homicides? And, uh, and you got to include suicides, I think. Also. Yeah, yeah, true. I mean, I think with suicides, I mean, on that, I think if they're if you're if you're in a place where you don't want to live anymore, I don't think not having access to a gun is going to change anything. There's just so many ways you can off yourself. You know, yeah, it's but like, most people fail when they take pills or whatever. Mm, a lot of times, it turns out to be a cry for help that they then get addressed. Right. As opposed to the gun, it's one and done. I feel I feel like if you're in the mentality though, where it's like you are, this is not a cry for help. Like yeah. you're you're doing it for real. And and I uh, I had a stepbrother actually who uh, shot himself. Oh like, no! Like that's how he went out. Really? Mm-hmm. Shotgun in the mouth. Jesus. So it's like that is not a cry for help. But I feel like if you're at that point, if it's not going to be a gun, you're going to hang yourself. You're going to throw yourself off a building. You're going to do something else that has a uh, a high rate of I hate to use the word success. <laughs> But like a high rate of like, you did it. He did it. it. (laughs) He's not a quitter. Go Jim. (laughs) Right. Yeah. But I, yeah. So I, I think on that and and the, the, the weapon isn't that important when it comes to removing yourself. And then as far as gun violence, it's been a while since I've, I've dug into the stats as well. It's been a few years. Because you're a digger. That's what you do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, research topic after topic yeah. and stuff. And, and we definitely like looked into it. And, and there are a lot of stats, you know, kind of all over the place. Um, it's okay. Why, like, why are the guns, you know, being used? I mean, like, like when you're looking at like gun violence crimes, like homicides or whatever, it's like, okay, was it gang related? Is very different than a mall shooter. Is very different than just some home random invasion. person. Yeah, home. There's so many different scenarios. Right, right. And I think it's it's hard to. Yeah, I don't I don't know what the numbers say as far as um. I guess to step back, if we, if we got rid of all the guns, I, I understand the argument of like, hey, these people are dying. Guns are what is killing them. Uh, we can't just have all these people continue to die like this. Right. I worry that it's a, a cultural thing in America more than the weapons. We're like, we'll compare ourselves to European countries and things. And it's like, OK, they have a much lower rate of violence. They're also so different culturally to the point where like, you feel it when you're over there. You right. feel a different energy. Yeah. My concern is there is something basically wrong in America as far as violence that is it's not about the weapon. It's about like who we are as a culture and, you know, like the wild West and this, you know, manifest destiny. And it's like how much of that is like woven into our kind of cultural DNA. Right. And and how do we get out of that? And like government paranoia. Mm -hmm. And I think paranoia in, in general is where a lot of like gun violence comes from those horrible stories where somebody just knocking at the door and then they get shot and it's just like right. a kid or something right. and some paranoid homeowner shoots them why are we so paranoid you know and how much is the media to blame that way where you're uh you know pushing this these media companies pushing this narrative of crime and and murder and stuff all the time yeah that affects people you know and it, it gets people worked up yes i think that when you went into the psyche of this country i do think it's we're being led around by interests that want us to from day one mm-hmm. from reconstruction they wanted people to be in conflict in this country <laughs> and then you pass out guns yeah. and you just watch shit happen and they right? love it they benefit from it. it it works so well for well it's like the yellow journalism too and that progression you know as far as tabloid and just you know if it bleeds it leads that mentality right and it's like, uh, it's a weird like chicken and the egg, I guess, you know, like how much are we as a consumer responsible for, for falling for the tricks of politicians and media? How much is them, you know, as far as like what's going on with our culture? But yeah, they, it, it, it benefits politicians, benefits big media to keep us scared. Fear is a, such a powerful emotion. It makes people want to go buy things and makes, makes people want to vote a certain way. Yeah. I wonder how we're going to ever get get out of that. I don't know. That's the question. Is 
Are we too far entrenched? Like you see now what's happening with Kevin McCarthy being ousted as yeah. the Speaker of the House because he wouldn't count out to these crazy, what is it, eight of them? Is yep. it like eight? Yeah, I think so. I eight think, yeah, nut very bags. small, yeah. And group. you go like, okay, is that progress? Is this maybe a point we're going to look at and go, okay, this is where the Republicans kind of went, we're not going to be led around by fear and by right. hatred and right. by zealots. And uh, we'll see because right now the government – is kind of shut down. No yeah. legislation can go forward until we have, uh, you know, a Senate majority leader again. It's such a crazy thing where it's like what uh, McCarthy. Oh, wait, was, to see the Speaker of the House. Speaker of the House. Speaker of the House. Right. Yeah, McCarthy, where he was, uh, what criticized for working with some Democrats was a big part of it too, right? Yeah. I haven't read all the articles. Yeah. But like that's such a frustrating thing where it's seen as a, a sign of weakness. To want to reach across the yeah, aisle now, right? Where, where that used to be the norm, you know, yeah. decades ago. It used like, to be fun. <laughs> right? K Street, you go to a bar, and you know, uh, uh, what's his name, the 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 senator from Massachusetts, uh, 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 I forget his name, but there was a bunch of guys. Ted Kennedy was one of those guys who re reached across the aisle and um, to get things done. They got things done, and that was fun. That was the whole point. Mm -hmm. Was like, how do we? How do we like, you know, meet in the middle somehow? Because right. in the end, you're supposed to be representing people. You're not supposed to be using them as, as tokens against, yeah. you know, to, to, to propagate your own party. It's fucking crazy. And McCarthy did say on his way out, he's like, well, you know, he's like, I'm going to feel good about what I did. It's like I, I tried to do the right thing, yeah, basically. Right. And I agree. It's just unfortunate that, you know, uh, doing the right thing and being, you know, politically favorable and the optics of that, the way yeah. people are now. Don't don't match up too well a lot of the time. The only thing that seems to um, mollify this kind of uh, atmosphere is when there's a world war mm -hmm. or there's like a 9-11. That's right. the times when we yep. come together. It's the it's the the other. You have not now you have a boogeyman or, or a legitimate other right to focus everybody's you know uh, fear on and uh, you know. But we kind of had that with COVID, and it became partisan. <laughs> Right, right. Pretty yeah, quickly. Yeah, COVID wasn't like a good enemy sociologically for like America because of all the different, because of all the conspiracies right. and stuff. I mean, that's been fascinating to watch how that affects polarization, where I remember with Time Suck, the, the, the deep dive podcast I've done where I made fun of a lot of conspiracies the first couple years of Time Suck and very little kickback. I remember the first one I got like kickback and it just kind of surprised me because I didn't know about this pocket of the internet at the time was Pizzagate. It's an outlandish QAnon, right? Yeah, it, yeah. It was like pre-QAnon. Pizzagate yeah, oh, yeah, led into QAnon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pizzagate was the one, the Comet Pizza, the basement there where the the far leftists part of it. It always goes back to a global elite, and they have children in cages and they're torturing them to drink their adrenochrome. And it, it oh, always wasn't Hillary involved. Oh yeah, yeah. Hillary, yeah. Uh, a lot of other uh, you know leading Democrats were going there to essentially feast on children. <laughs> I mean, it's right. It's crazy. Did you get it to go or did you have to have it in the. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. I'll take a eight year old's liver just uh, for pickup. If you Is, could. Are they good rare. with red pepper? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Why a pizza place? Maybe it's because they think kids like pizza. And so that'll kind of right. be like. It was out of these emails, these emails that they saw. There was some it was a place where some politicians were meeting this common yeah, pizza. Right. And that's and, and then they just, you know, deciphered. They decoded the emails to figure out what's really going on. And a cheese slice is actually represents sexual torture or whatever. Uh -huh. I mean, the irony with like common pizza is like uh, all this stuff is supposedly going on in the basement of common pizza. And there there is no basement like the yeah, place legitimately yeah. doesn't have a basement. Right, right. And uh, and then, if you know, if you dig into a conspiracy like that in QAnon or whatever, if you're a rational person, you can quickly assess like, oh, this is outlandish nonsense. This yeah. is craziness. But there's this growing movement of people who just employ magical thinking and it doesn't matter what evidence you have. And it, and it was like funny to me like six years ago. I'm like, oh, it's just it's real fringe. Yeah. And now you have people in Congress who advocate that these are real things, you know, right. like like QAnon is fucking insane. Yeah, it's. Jesus sent Trump to save us from Satan, from essentially. Satan. Yeah. Is the, it's like, are you kidding me? Right. It's like, take politics out of it. That guy? That yeah. guy is who right. this... I mean, for me, as a non-religious person, it's like, there's a lot of hurdles I got to jump over. I got I to gotta believe in Jesus, for starters. Yeah. Which I don't. And then I got to believe that... But I understand the concept of Jesus and... The concept of Jesus doesn't match up with picking this guy. It's well, just it's all crazy. That's what my whole point is that Jesus, like... 
all these QAnon people, <laughs> right. they're Christians, and there's nothing they hate more than the woke movement. Right. But who's more woke than Jesus Christ? I know. The irony. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. is washed the feet of mm-hmm. the poor and, you know, talked yeah. to prostitutes. Well, we all oh. talked to prostitutes, but he was helping them. <laughs> he was with them. He was with them. Yep. That always seemed convenient, though, didn't it? That Jesus was hanging out with the prostitutes. Well, there's supposedly all these, like, right, all those other books. Well, not supposedly. There's all those other books that didn't make it into being canonized in the Bible. And some of those presented a more humanist Jesus. And some of them actually presented him as being in some sort of relationship, probably romantically with Mary Magdalene. No. Oh yeah. There's all these other, but it's like, you know, the council of Nicaea, they're like, ah, that doesn't work for the narrative we want. Right. Those got pushed to the side and like, this is who he is. But even the, even the books that got left in, clearly he's like, he would be at a grateful dead concert. Sure. You know, he'd be on shrooms. He's you know, got long love hair. Another. He's wearing yeah, a dress. He's, a he's transitioning. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I do love the irony of, and he's Middle Eastern, you know, yep. he's not white. He's absolutely not, white. not white. He doesn't right. have blue eyes. Right. No, nope. and, and I just love the irony of, and for Christian fundamentalists in the U.S., is like, if Jesus looking like the biblical Jesus showed up at your door, you wouldn't open it. That's right. You know, you'd call the police or you'd show up with a gun and be like, get the fuck off my property. Yeah. Ah, at the very crazy. least, you'd call him a communist. Right. And yeah. he was a communist. Yeah, he was a communist. And it's like, and, and I am not into communism at all, but like, I understand like the benefit of certain socialist policies. Yeah. And I just love that, like, the base who wears the most cross necklaces and claim to be the most godly consistently vote in ways that do not reflect, that are the opposite of who biblical Jesus was. Right. It's. Well, a lot of so these insane. churches down south now are about Joel Osteen and all these guys. Yeah, the prosperity the gospel. The prosperity gospel. Which, what what part that of that comes from Jesus? That doesn't make sense. Yes. Jesus wanted to get that fucking money. Yeah. Jesus wanted to be riding in his, you know, uh, Range Rover. And right. All. It's right. crazy. I feel sorry for people that are, because my mom is a true believer. You know, she. Yeah. I grew up very Catholic. A lot of great people. A lot of, a lot great, of great people. people. And I feel sorry for people like her because the whole name of Christianity has been co-opted by politics and by And I do greed. think most, totally, most Christians I do believe still are people who are like, there's certain lessons that they love from it and they culturally identify. It's an important part of like, I don't want to say nostalgia, but like they grew up in it and it's, it's comforting. And I get it is that. nostalgia. That's a good, I think that's a fair word for yeah, it. Yeah, you know, you grow up and you have a feeling that comes from it and yeah. you feel taken care of. And there's this uh, there's a community. community and a deity that's looking out for you. Yeah. It's like, I get it. And I think that most people in that are still the really good people. But there is a big contingent that are so easily manipulated because of the magical thinking. Right. And I think like you have to employ some magical thinking to be religious. Yeah. And leave logic to the side to a certain degree. And then when conspiracies come along, it feeds into the same part of the brain. Yeah. Yep. The doors open. You walk in and and politicians. I believe that, you know, a, a lot of politicians that may not seem super intelligent, get made fun of for being dumb. They're not dumb. Yeah. They understand how to exploit of course. magical thinking. No, and because they're so they're good all, at it. All our society comes down to is, I guess most societies, is getting people to make the choice you want them to make. Yeah. You know, whether it's at the voters' mm-hmm. booth or, or, or voting box. <laughs> i got to wake the fuck up. I have such jet lag right now. You're going to have to carry this interview. Oh, no. <laughs> um, but I was thinking about this yesterday. Yeah. Like, it really all comes down to getting people to choose a certain way. Mm-hmm. And you will do anything to do that. We right. have right. most colleges, their main degree is marketing. It's literally, mm-hmm. we're teaching all new waves of people to come in and get you to choose the way they want, whether it's to buy a product or yeah. to visit this place in Tahiti or whatever it is. Right. It's a it's 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 manipulation of choice. And yeah. religion is the easiest way in because it's yeah. not aggressive. It's a gentle way in. Oh yeah, I'm here with you. I love God too. And here's what yeah. God would tell you to do. God, it is such an interesting thing. You're right. Like we're all we're all fighting to get others to subscribe to our ideology. Right. You know, even if like for me, my ideology is to leave me the fuck alone. Yeah. And you go have your I to a degree where kids aren't being hurt, you know, certain things, but like I'm very, I, for lack of a better term, libertarian, even though even with that group, I don't agree with certain things. Yeah. But I like like 
just just stop telling me how to live if, if it's not hurting anybody else. Right. But I guess that's an ideology I'm trying to push. We're all trying to push. Right. Please accept my beliefs. But then there's right. so many of us where it's like, I can respect somebody else's beliefs if they have logical, a logical basis for it, as opposed to where I, where I run into problems with certain you know political movements and religious movements is like, this is the way you're supposed to live. Because and, and I'm like, well, why? Why is it that? Why is that the way I'm supposed to live? Well, because this person said so. Yeah. Who said so? Oh, this person who lived two thousand years ago. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but we don't even know who that person was. It, it's just, it's just a weird. Or we don't even know what they said. It was written right. down Translated. hundreds of years later. <laughs> right. Right. And like you said, Telephone and game. then the, and then the books that went into the Bible were handpicked. There were a lot of books that could have gone in the Bible. Yeah. There's other Bibles. Yeah. There's other versions. Right. There's an editor's cut. You know, and. Uh, yeah, and it is interesting that we want everybody to think like us because, you know, wh- how what a fucking boring world that would be, you know? <laughs> if they if everyone all did if think if like everybody us, everybody thought the same. I mean, and that's like, yeah. I think that I think that that's the, what people think happens in communist countries, is mm. that everybody starts to think the same, but they don't realize that like if you're really in a communist country, yeah. there's people muttering. Under their yeah, breath exactly. all day long. They There's, just can't openly dissent yeah. because of consequences. Right. There's never yeah. a society that's homogenous. You don't want right, it. Right, right, right. Yeah. I know. Just finding that like happy, happy place in the middle. I don't know. All right. I, so I, let me give yeah. you some, I'll give you some subjects and you tell me whether or not the government should be involved. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Guns. Yes. Yes, there has to be government oversight that as far as like mental health, you know, uh, testing, like who is able to buy them. I wish that there would be laws passed where if someone takes one of your guns that you've left unlocked and commits a terrible crime, you are very much also responsible where it's like to to really strongly encourage gun like so like if your son takes your assault weapon and goes yeah. to school with it you go to jail yeah it's like yeah. Why, why did he have access right. to right. your assault weapon yeah you should have had that locked i have a safe that my kids have no idea what the combination is yeah you know it's like if that's unlocked well then that's on me if i just leave that out in the open well then that's on me to a certain degree yeah and, and i think that would like uh because i think most people are responsible gun owners who despise the random mass shooter more than a non-gun owner it's yeah. like what are you doing right, so, right. but but i think you know that requires some governmental oversight and if left to our own devices and there's no government oversight well then people are going to have fucking bazookas and anti you know tank miss it's like it's yeah gonna get even crazier than it is right 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 yeah okay uh abortion abortion uh no government well i guess you know that is a tricky one to me it's like when Late term, I guess, I guess I, I do think there should be government oversight because, you know, this doesn't happen. It's like a boogeyman thing. It's like almost no, no one is getting an abortion like really like one in a billion. That's like eight months. I know. I know. It, it's this it's this propaganda thing. Yes. But just to make sure that doesn't happen, I think you have to have some kind of like, hey, if, uh, you know, you're a week away from delivery, it's not a good look. I don't know. I think I think <laughs> I think any parent that would be dumb enough to do that, right. we shouldn't force them to have that child. Right. Maybe the kid would be better off anyway. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but I'm for adoption. But yeah. But I think and I think in medical wise, you know, you, you shouldn't just to prevent back alley abortion type yeah, stuff. There right. needs to be uh, government oversight in that sense to to make sure that you know legit doctors are performing it's a proper medical procedure. But uh, but I am you know. I don't want too much government oversight just because I am I am very pro choice in that sense where I always think about, you know, the most dramatic thing, like scared teenager. They're they're 16. They're 17. Uh, there was a, there was an accident. You know, they have no way to provide for this child. Their parents right. are poor, you know, or even wor- worse than that, like a rape scenario, incest, incest scenario. Yeah. It's like, why? Why are we forcing, uh, you know? people to have this this little collection of cells why can't that thing that's not sentient right be destroyed and i think this there could be that magical thinking again the argument of like yeah but the soul right like, okay well, well who's to say that soul doesn't just move on okay let's say that the soul is real yeah this the collection of cells is destroyed and then the soul goes back to wherever souls that's hang out and comes back like why does it have yeah, to be yeah right because these are people that don't believe the soul is tied to the body Right, so why can't the soul just you know, float yeah. around and come back? Sure. Uh, 
that, that's always an interesting thing to me with it's like a flume thinking. ride. You get on the back and you go flying down again. <laughs> you don't get to the egg. You get back online. Exactly. You going. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 that's always interesting to me where someone is being imaginative or creative. Maybe they wouldn't see it that way with their notions of God and, yeah. and spirituality. It's like, okay, well, if you get to kind of leave logic behind and employ that thinking, then so do I. Yeah. And I can get creative with workarounds. Right. You know, it's like, okay, there's a soul. Fine. But, but how do you know that that soul is destroyed when the collection of cells is destroyed? Yeah. And if it's not, then what's the real issue? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this whole abortion thing, is, it's so weird that it's like state to state now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like weed. It's like, what are we doing here? I mean, right. um, but the Republicans oh. might have blown themselves up with the, with the abortion thing because that's what cost them the midterm elections. Mm-hmm. Is because women showed up and they were angry, and we'll see yeah. whether or not they're still angry at the next election. It, it's yeah, I know. Well, well I think tr- didn't Trump kind of? I think he's been pulling away from advocating being pro-choice, which I was like, really? oh, that's an interesting positioning, because there was a, a lot of anger among some of his base because of that. But to me, I'm like, not that I I'm not a fan of any major politician right now. So I'm not just saying this because you know jumping on the hate Trump bandwagon. But I think he is very intelligent. Yes. Very, very intelligent. People like, oh, he's an idiot. No, he's not. He's, he, he is, he's funny he's and an, he's smart. Yeah. He, That's he's, why it's so dangerous. He's a dark wizard. Yeah. He's a very smart. And, and it's like, I bet he's seeing the landscape and being like, okay, well, I'm going to, uh-huh. they're still going to vote for me rather than a quote lib. So I'll still keep these votes. But then if I can also be pro-choice and more open about that, I'll get the moderates. Yeah. And he's not wrong. All right. Yeah. No, I mean it was definitely what swayed the last election. It was that one issue, and it's not. It's pretty rare that there's a one issue thing yeah. that tracks that strong, but that that's going to track in the next election. It's interesting where I live, northern Idaho, to see they 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 take things to such an extreme politically around there, and with all of the uh, you know pro life stuff, it's very pro life area, yeah. deep dark red pro pro life where I where I live, and then Bonner County, I believe, is the county. It's Sandpoint. It's like an hour north of Coeur d'Alene. <laughs> They passed this. They don't think about the repercussions. I mean, they didn't finally, but they don't think about how it can backfire. They pass this new law where if you're a doctor and you deliver a baby and the child dies, basically like you have to make a decision to save the life of the mother at the expense of the child right. or something just happens. Right. Anybody in the entire county would then be able to sue you, not just wow. the mom, for the death of that child, for your no decision. Kidding. The re- The consequences of them passing that was – Countywide, all the OBGYNs and just doctors in general just said, okay, we're not delivering babies, period, ever. Go to another county to have your baby, not going to risk that lawsuit. And then all of a sudden, doctors, it was like a brain drain started to happen. They started to leave. And then the local politicians were like, oh, shit, we didn't think about that. Yeah. And I, I, I see, wow. I, I bet more of that starting to happen around the country. We're in Texas and other states, these crazy laws where you can sue. You can sue the person that drove you to the abortion clinic. Right. Yeah. And, and murder charges, homicide That's like charges. Some fucking Orwellian shit. That's crazy. <laughs> right. Well, thank God people are starting to push back away from it. Because where, where I get scared about that stuff is if they weren't, maybe I just am too into The Handmaid's Tale. It's one of yeah. my wife and I's favorite shows. Yeah. But like when we get really into that show, we will start, like when we get ourselves worked up. We're like, maybe we should look at like the Nordic countries. Maybe we should leave the country. Yeah. Like, because it seems plausible in moments sure. where it's like, you know, a, a democracy shifts to a theocracy if just enough of the voting population is of that same kind of theological bent, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and it's not even, it's like you were saying, it's not even, a, I don't know if you call it theological, it's def- certainly not spiritual. It's mm. become an alignment. It's become a thing that people wear on their sleeves and they they come together under the banner of it but they don't yeah. these aren't people that are getting on their knees and communing mm. with Jesus Christ. I mean most of these people right. are just doing it because they were told to by their neighbors and their their coworkers and you know it just try to put yourself yeah. in a in a place where everybody thinks the same. And I actually give yeah. you credit for this because you are in an area that's like that and you maintain your own set of principles and beliefs. To my, but most people to my can. detriment sometimes. Most yes. people can. <laughs> no, I mean it's very it's it's like, you know, they've done sociological experiments where they put people in light when like mm-hmm. mind. Everybody changes their mind. Yeah, Everybody wants think. to fit in. Yeah, I have a I don't know if it's the way I was raised or something, but but I thought about that with this business too. You know, there's pressure to think a certain way and it's like 
and I've even told my fans, uh, we got a bunch of kickback uh, a while back where we donated to, we donate to charities every month, part of our subscription money. And we donated to the North Idaho Pride Alliance. I think it's, and we donate to conservative, we donate to religious, we donate to atheists, all across the board. We spread it around. Yeah. And there was a crazy amount of kickback from fans where all of a sudden the word pride had become a triggering word. It wasn't like a year earlier. Yeah. And it was this narrative of, uh, they're grooming our children. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the trends and the gay, they're grooming our children. And I got so angry. It's like, we lost, I don't know, maybe 15% of our fans or whatever. And I just told him, I'm like, there was like these threats of like, okay, I'll pull my subscription money or whatever. And I was like, you know what? Fucking do it then. Because yeah. I am not afraid to work a non-entertainment job. Right. And I go, if I have to become a piece of shit to make this work, yeah. then let's just end it. Right. You know, but like I'll, I'll drive this into the fucking dirt rather than not be able to look at myself in the mirror because I sacrifice my principles for, for money and stuff. Right. And that, that one just pissed me off so much because we've covered so many topics of, you know, people who are molesting children. And the irony of the far right being worried about transgender or homosexuals, you know, molesting, grooming, their, the fucking Catholic Church has done more of that than right, any institution right. and, yeah. and continues to. Yeah. Th that stuff is ongoing. And not just them, you know, like you look at the, D the Duggars, there was that scandal in their family. If you look into a lot of evangelical, you know, like uh, denominations. Oh, the Amish, rampant Jewish, pedophilia. Yeah, there's tons of Jehovah's Witnesses, that are... huge amount of pedophiles. Yeah, like yeah. within the uh, Hasidic Jewish yeah. stuff. Any little uh, group where women and children are not protected because of a strong patriarchal kind of setup and uh, you're not supposed to, you know, what is it? Yeah, respect your father or whatever. They're, they're just, they don't like listen to victims. Yeah. But like, it, it's it's like if you really, I just think that a lot of the people who are worked up about this grooming, it's like if you really cared about your children, focus your energy in a more rational place. Yeah. All the satanic panic stuff, fi find 10 examples of quote unquote Satanists molesting children. You can't. Yeah. Because that's not who's doing it. Right, right. It's probably your pastor next door. Yeah. Or, and I hate to say, like, there's a lot of good pastors. There's a lot of good Catholics. There's a lot of like that. But it's like more likely that it is than this weird boogeyman we've made up. Yeah. Why do you, so you, so you think it's a patriarchal thing. And, and also, it, it seems like um, there's a, the, it, it became, I guess, accepted if you were a priest. Hmm. To just look the other way. That's what was so fucking sick about it. Even if you weren't doing it, yeah. you knew about it. And these yeah. people are not paying taxes. It is <laughs> you talk about any corporation. If fucking <laughs> right, Apple right. Computers yeah. had three child molesters <laughs> on the board that were caught, their stock price ah! would go to zero and they would go I'd out of I never thought of that angle. Yes. And you've got a centuries and centuries old religion that propagates child molestation, the concealing of it, yeah, and somehow they get a tax break. It's in, no, it's insane. To give like I used to think like oh man, it's like oh, there's these evil groups of people. I I no longer really believe that. I think a lot of the people looking the other way. Let's say in the Catholic Church, I don't think they're bad people. I think it's it's just a, a problematic belief system. Um, it's people who believe that the power of God can change them if uh, okay a priest uh molests three eight-year-olds and then they get caught by another priest or whatever they hear about it i think a lot of these other priests truly believe that if this person repents and you know accepts jesus into their hearts more strongly they'll be strong enough to not do that again it's this problematic belief system where that's not how pedophilia works right all the science is your brain is it's a disease yeah, yeah. But I know, and I know, like, okay, a friend yeah, of mine. Yeah, but the priests are smarter than that. I've known a lot of Catholic priests in my life. They're highly <sighs> intelligent to be. people. Yeah, yeah, the Jesuits. I, I went to school Gonzaga, and they yeah, are I'm very— Yeah, I'm thinking of the Jesuits more. But, uh, but I, I, maybe I just want to believe that. Yeah. But I, but I know that, you know, that stuff happens. You don't hear about the scandals on the uh, kind of evangelical side as much. I think mostly because they're, they're not as organized as, like, the Roman Catholic Church has such a— strong hierarchy there's just there's more catholics part of that denomination there is uh this random sect of baptists or anabaptists or lutherans or whatever yeah but there's a lot of that stuff that goes on in the non-denominational world as well or just protestant like a, like a friend of mine uh 
dad took in a guy. Dad was part of this very kind of fundamentalist backwoods in Washington State Church. And, Your father was? Uh, their father. This, oh. this, this friend's father was. And so they grew up, you know, really fundamentalist. And there would be people who would come from one church to the next in their town and need a place to stay. And it was just a practice where you'd accept people into your home, yeah. you know, just to help somebody out. And one of the people they helped out was a known pedophile, but had repented. Like, but it was known in the church. Yeah. But repented. Christ cured him, essentially. Brought this guy into the into the house. Turns out, they find out later, this guy raped my friend's brother for like four years and then he eventually killed himself and it's like who did the brother mm -hmm, the, the the kid who was molested wow. you know and it's that thing where the wow. dad who That's let heavy. the person into their house they i think they truly believed that like my god cured them and it's such a sad thing where it's like your heart was in the right place but your fucking brain wasn't right Right? right. That's why science is important, man. That's why studies are important. You can't ignore how, all that. How shit. do you broach an institution that is based on a man walking on water and parting a sea and rising from the dead? And how do you go? Oh, by the way, the molestation thing is a disease. It's not. <laughs> it's not a magic thing that that fixes itself. How do you? How do those two places intersect? That's what scares me. Yeah. That, that's where I get real nihilistic. When I started thinking going down that rabbit hole too far, I'm like, you know what? What if we lived in Portugal? Yeah. You know, I just started thinking, which I know is a historically Catholic country or like, you know, some of the Scandinavian countries. Yeah. I will say I was in Norway this last summer and the vibe is just so chill. People don't seem angry. Yeah. You know, um, politics, religion. I, I don't think they're a huge part of people's lives. They're more just like... Uh, well, everybody always points to the Scandinavian mm. countries, and the reason why they go, well, you know, in Scandinavia, there's early childhood education, and there's paternity leave for six months, and all. Yeah. I go, you know why? Because Denmark has Greenland, which is a giant fucking oil rig. I know. And they're pumping money into the economy. There's a reason why people don't have to, you know, and so... That's the, Norway, too. Yeah, is Norway have oil also? This is such a crazy thing in the 60s. If you go to certain little uh, cities on the uh, Norwegian coasts, there's all these like Texas restaurants, uh -huh. like Texas steakhouses. I was like, what the hell? It's because Texans, oil people, came there when they found offshore oil in like 50s or 60s, one of those two, and helped them build the infrastructure yeah. from it. And they have so much money. There's like 6 million people living in Norway, roughly. And they started taking their oil money and putting it, all the surplus money that they didn't need, the government, and putting it into a fund, like an investment fund for the country of Norway. I believe it's at $1.2 trillion now. Yeah, yeah. And so when that oil money goes away, they're going to have They've got the, uh, international real estate holdings yeah, and everything and be able yeah. to just have a good quality of life forever. Yeah. And I know it's amazing. hard to replicate that here. Well, can you get in there? Because like my wife just got her Irish passport. My my paperwork is being done right now because ah. our, our grandparents are from there. Yeah, and, that's uh, so, that's so cool. I knew you were Irish, but I I didn't know your wife. Well, is she's a half Jewish, half Irish. Okay, so is like what's the percentage? Half is what it, you one need? grandparent. As long as you have oh. one parent grandparent from, from Ireland, there. you can get their birth certificate, their death certificate, marriage certificate, and your parents' birth certificates. Submit it. And a year later, you're a, you're a citizen of, uh, or you have a passport Man. to there. I've never been there, but I've heard so many good things. I was things. just there this summer. It's amazing. Ah, my wife's been there, and I have a fair amount of Irish blood. My Scott Irish is the main chunk of my heritage. Scotch Irish? Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah, Cummins what is, is a she? Scottish name. Uh, oh, my wife, she's um, Polish, almost totally Polish. Yeah. Uh, and a little bit of German. So basically, they So, uh, yeah, because I know there's some countries. I know Italy allows the grandfather thing as well. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Portugal. I don't know about Scotland. But do you have any Irish grandparents? No, it goes too far back. Yeah. The closest I have as far as like family from another country would be a Swedish and Norwegian great grandparents. Oh, yeah. Uh, from that there, but it's too far. You. Yeah. Yeah. But there's, there's golden passport places in other countries like Portugal and stuff. Yeah. Where, you know, you buy a certain amount of real estate. Right, right. You're good. Yeah. Are you guys thinking about maybe. Well, it's like you're there? talking about. It's like that thing in the back of your head mm. when shit gets really crazy and you go like, hey, we can get out. We can get out. I, I mean, I got a, I got a house in Venice I could rent out yeah, that, I, yeah. that, that I bought 22 years ago, oh. and it would, it would pay for a very nice life I love overseas. It. Yeah, that's so great. I mean, congrats. So, I mean, that is, that is so cool just to have that option. Yeah, I you know. know. I that's know. so cool.
And uh, it'll probably never happen because ultimately it's about friends. I mean, I don't yeah. know. I don't know what your community is like up in. Uh, we have a good group of friends. Yeah, I mean that's mm-hmm. what it's about. If you have to, if you have yeah. some friends to hang out with, but to go to a completely different place and start over in my at, at sixty, I don't know. I know. Yeah, I mean, I guess you'd have to go over there. I, I would look at it like we've just talked about. What if we just went and just went over for two months, three yeah. months, and you test it, and and then who knows. You know, sometimes you get lucky and you meet really cool people and and you can hit it off and then you're not tied there if you can come back after a few months. And right. but I like the I get restless. Yeah. I like the thought of that adventure of just, you know, starting over. Yes. But, you know, with thanks to cell phones and the Internet, it's like it's pretty easy to keep in touch with people as well, too. Right. But, uh, yeah, we might test it. I, yeah. I think about just history, you know, st- cycles where it's, I think about with Lindsay. My thing is if we go into this cycle that could last 30, 40 years or longer, there's just going to be a shit show. And those are the last good years I have on earth. Yeah. And I have the option to do, to go somewhere else and you can podcast from anywhere in the world. Then, you know, we might take Kids it. are the only thing. How, how old is your kid? Yeah. We have a, a 17 year old who actually, he graduated high school a year early and he's going to college now. Oh, okay. And then we have a, a sophomore in high school, 15 year old. Oh. About to turn 16. Oh, so yeah, yeah. We got a. We got mine just graduated college and the other one's a sophomore in college. Okay. So we're we're free. I mean, technically yeah, we're yeah. free to go. Would they live somewhere else? They love Venice. They grew up here. Yeah. They you know it's a special place. They they've lived other places and you know, just for college and they just came right back. And so uh I think that we, we have like a guest house in the back and I think yeah. they could probably live back there. Manage so, the front house. Okay. And uh you know, yeah. we could go off and do our thing for a while. I mean, like you said, yeah. Pod, I did stand up in Ireland this summer, and it was. Oh, I saw that on your great. Instagram. Oh yeah. my god, it was so your first fun. time, right? My first time doing it in Ireland. Yeah, god, that's so cool. But you realize there's gigs all over Europe, and especially if I've got an yeah. Irish passport and I can actually get paid in right? euros. Yeah, yeah. Do my podcast from there? Do some stand up over there? Why not? I, I, that's what I think about: is if you have these options, you know, why not? You know, at least consider taking them. Yeah. You know, I, uh, yeah, I'm actually just, it's funny. I, I came, came to do some podcasts to talk about special and a tour. I actually just, um, am canceling all my dates. I'm, I'm doing, I have one date next year and I was supposed to do this big theater tour and it was just like with all the research and everything, I've been, I've been pretty burnt out, yeah. you know, just getting it all done. Yeah. And I'm so conditioned to just like, well, yeah, you get these gigs and you're so thankful for getting these gigs and you got to like get the next gig. And I just, I'm like, that's just, there was never a thought in my brain about like, you don't have to. You could push it for a while. Uh-huh. And I, that that thought finally got in just out of fatigue. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. We're in such a cool time or we live during such a cool time, especially with podcasting and the way we can monetize different things. I'm like, no, I, I could wait. Yeah. I, I could take. And I, and I learned from the pandemic that I was able to get back into stand up after I took a year and a half off. And I'm like, I could push things for nine months, 10 months yeah. if I want. And and then that opens up thoughts of like, you know, being able to live different places. Mm hmm. So wait, you pushed off your dates for this winter? Uh, for next year. Yeah, for I'm going to finish out the ones on the calendar. The ones on my website now, I'm going to you know, honor all the contracts. Yeah. Because those have been announced. But we were getting ready to announce uh, a bunch for next year, and it was just filling me with dread. Really? Yeah, it's because of time suck mostly. It's because of uh, the research it takes and oversight with like, you know, a couple employees. That takes a little time. I do a horror podcast as well. I just overextended myself. You do three podcasts, right? Uh, I I was I, I got rid of one a couple of years ago. Okay, and then I actually just got I'm getting shutting down another weekly subscription one I had because of, again so much time. Yeah, and it's like the last six years, even on like on vacation, like I say, like okay, we go to Norway. I work half days every day. Yeah, right. You know, right. getting making sure I'm not buried when I come back. Uh huh. And I just want a little breather from that. So you're doing two podcasts, but they're both pretty work intensive. Yeah, a lot of prep. Very, very, yeah. you know, there's storytelling. Like piece of shit podcast. <laughs> I'm like, so have we met before? <laughs> no, I love, you know what? I wanted to do a podcast like this, but when I lived, was moving to Coeur d'Alene for, for you know, family reasons, uh, I knew that I would have a very hard time. And that was right before Zoom became more common as far yeah. as talk to us. And I'm like, who who am I going to get to come to Coeur d'Alene? Nobody on a regular basis. So I did think like I need to do a solo podcast. And I do like I, I genuinely enjoy learning about things. Yeah. So it's a combination of like practicality 
has to be so low because I don't know who I'm going to be able to get here. Yeah. And then interest wise. But like I, I love these podcasts that are conversational. They're so fun. Yeah, it's a good hang. I like it. And yeah. I like that there's I would only have on a guest that I trust. You know, you got to look at oh, yeah. watch their special. I mean, that's my research, which I fucking love. I love watching people's specials because, <laughs> you know, also I'm starting to direct specials a little bit. And I like to see choices oh, yeah. they made about cameras and lighting yeah. and, you know, editing, the pacing of editing. And there's so many things that go into it that you don't. You don't think about when you watch a special, but there's there's yeah. a lot of thought that goes into it. I I really like the style of oh, this thanks. most recent one. Yeah, you know that was actually the guy who did it. Uh, never directed a special before. Oh really? I uh, I worked at a. I met him. I did reality TV for a while in addition to stand up. Yeah. I was I would work at um, kind of like it was when I was living here in L A. And at Gurney Productions mainly down by LAX is where I was doing it. Where I would work there either the whole week if I didn't have dates, or they would let me bounce out like Thursday Friday to go do shows. And there was this guy, I, I just was a, uh, what, consulting producer, I think would be the yeah. the credit, you know, right. doing the pre-production of basically basically working as a writer outside of the union. Yeah, it's a writer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this guy, Mike O'Dare, I just thought he was such a genius. And he was a showrunner over there and just really smart guy. And we became friends. And then he wanted to try his hand at like directing a, a special. And I was like, okay. I'd love to just get a different look. Yeah. And then he used his editor, who also was not used to editing. I don't think he'd ever edited a stand-up performance before. Yeah. They come from the reality world. And, you know, a lot of those reality shows are built mostly by the editors. That's right. That's who make them watch. Sure. Of course. They've got yeah. thousands and thousands of hours to go through. I don't, yeah. I don't know how you do that. So he came in and you got uh, local equipment, local camera guys and, and all that. Matt Schuler. Uh, who he works for 800 pound gorillas mostly now. Yeah, I know Matt. I'm right. talking to Matt at okay. two o'clock today. Oh, yeah. awesome. I love Matt. Yeah. Uh, it was his production company. So we hired okay. them. And so he was the one who coordinated everything. It's like yeah. I brought in a director, uh, editor, but then he went and definitely credit him with transforming that space because the Parkway Theater we recorded it in, it's essentially used mostly as an old movie theater now yeah. in Minneapolis. And it, I was very, it was not the top choice. It was kind of like, what markets do we have left? that we haven't burned with this material. Right. And I had burned all my favorite markets. Uh-huh. I do like Minneapolis, but I was worried about that venue looking pretty janky. Uh-huh. Because it did before we... But the... Man, the way they kind of just cleaned things up and hid things yeah. was incredible. Yeah, the lighting looked great. You had a lot of lot of different uh, lighting angles going on. And did you have a jib? Looks like you had... Was that a jib? Uh, or was that... Did we end up using one? We were going to... I think... Something think, was moving around up there. Yeah, maybe we did. Maybe yeah, we did. I, I can't. Tell. I can't remember. Yeah, because I remember we were back and forth on if we wanted to kill those seats or not. Uh huh. And then the lighting. Yeah, I was happy with the lighting because I uh I have very red skin hues. Yeah. So and I when I get like heated, I just get that big tomato head. Yeah. And so we have to be like aware of that where it's like no red hues. Right. Put a lot of blues on there. Make me look less like a. Alex Jones That's type good. type face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did you do the special on spec and just put it on YouTube directly? Yeah. You did? Yeah. yeah, that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm shooting with Matt in uh oh. at Joe Rogan's club in November. Oh, you your special? At there? the mothership. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I've, I'm jealous. I have not been there to check out that club. Last time I was in Austin was before it opened and I was at uh, Cap City, which I also love. Yeah. But the mothership looks incredible. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, I was yeah. there like six months ago. I did it, and it was, uh, it's as good as it gets. I mean, the crowds are amazing, and just the room yeah. they built. I mean, Joe built it. It was like a, a comedian with an erection building a comedy <laughs> club. It's just <laughs> right. like, you know, they brought the, brought the state. They oh. made everything custom made to make it perfect. And so, uh, no, but uh, but Matt is going to, Matt's going to do it. But it is like, you know, that's the new business model is like, mm -hmm. you know, it's very difficult to get something right onto Netflix or, yeah. you know, and then there's other places you can get it on, but then it's not going to get seen. That's so, the thing. It's like it can get buried. Yeah. So you're better off just putting it on YouTube and yeah. pumping it up. You've got a ton of views. I don't know how many views you got in your special so far. I don't but know. Somewhere uh, 500,000 500, something. 500,000? That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I mean, really happy about it. You know, it definitely was nervous to... You know, like in the past where you throw it on, like I had one on Netflix a while, Comedy Central one years ago. But the nice thing about those was always like nobody knows how many 
people have watched it. Right. It's, it's not transparent. Right. So people see it like, oh my God, you're on TV. Uh-huh. You know, and it's like, yeah, you and three other people might have seen it, but right. it was on TV. With YouTube, I was nervous because the views are just right there yep. for every and the comments yep. for everyone to see. Yep. And I, uh, I, I, I became quickly a like insecure eighth grader again just like please like me i know (laughs) i know nobody else's job Uh, is fucking you quantify the way ours is now they can see how many views you got on your youtube page and how many you know uh but but it's like you know it's this leap of faith moment that feels kind of good once in a while to go like all right i'm gonna dig in my pocket and pull out a shitload of money to yeah. put out a special that I may not get any. I mean, did you have income streams from selling the special or just from the views on YouTube? No, I, I, uh, we thought about doing one of those, what, like moments, uh, moment house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, moment house, do one of those. We've done those for like live, you know, virtually live podcasts in the for- before, and it's been good. Thought about that, and I was like, you know what, just for people are being sold so many things, I don't want to do this weird series of steps where it's like hey go to moment uh, on this date yeah. to watch my special followed by like hey do this to get to download my to buy my special and then hey also go to youtube yeah i was like well i shot it mostly as a commercial ironically now that i'm gonna take a little break uh for touring but yeah i i i didn't want to have to do this jumbled pitch yeah of different things right, so right, just like right. nope it's just gonna be on youtube for a while yeah that i had this exact I, this is so weird we were having the same exact process i thought about doing moment yeah. house and i was yeah. like what am i gonna like go to go on half the podcast for moment house and then half to announce it on youtube right and then youtube's gonna have less because and you, again you want the graph you want the the, the numbers to look good on youtube yeah. so you don't want to yeah you know, splinter it out. So, and the algorithm, that's such, such a crazy thing where now it's like in order to get YouTube to recommend your special to more people, which is always the goal, you have to have these little like, um, moments of a lot of traffic where you're directing people like, check it out now, check it out now, check it out now. Is that right? And then, yeah, the algorithm and then interaction with like leaving comments and thumbs up. It's like all of that is taken into account. You you know, you go into your YouTube studio and you can see, you know, in-depth analytics, what is the like to dislike ratio? Yeah. How many people are leaving comments uh, in a short amount of time? And it's like all of that kind of pushes you up in their list of like who has released specials in the last, I don't know, however much time. And if, if you're above the average as far as engagement, you're going to get recommended more than people who are below the average. Interesting. It's just, that's been wow. Yeah, interesting. It's a lot to think about. I know. Well, one of the things the advice I got from somebody was, I think it was Neil Brennan said, nobody's mm. watching more than twenty minutes of your special anymore. So do all your best shit up front. God, that is interesting. I I know you know it's like after mine was a little long. We cut stuff, and it still ended up being like seventy minutes. And I I was thinking afterwards, I'm like, you know what? This next time, whenever I do another one, I'm not gonna think in terms of quote unquote an hour yeah i'm like if if i get 40 minutes that tend to be stronger sure. than the rest well then i don't have to release the rest you know what they didn't pay for it i know <laughs> right <laughs> right they complaining yep. about it's 20 minutes short short of what the nothing you gave me to watch it <laughs> shut up yeah Leave it. put a thumbs up do you go through the comments and get back to people uh i i do go through yeah the comments and then we have some people uh my Two guys in studio, Logan and Tyler, they also go through yeah. and give back to people too, just uh-huh. to make sure it's steady. Right. But I was a little worried about that too. Like, you know, like five, 10 years ago, I would have gotten angrier at negative stuff. And now I've just made it a game where I like to just to be super patronizing when someone's really upset. Oh, you do? Oh, you I love engage. It. I do engage with the, wow. with the anger ones. You know, if they, they say something super hateful. No matter what it is, I'm like, oh, thanks for stopping by. You sound like you're a really fun person. You'd be a joy to hang out with. Yeah. Uh, take care. You know, yeah. just something like little heart. Right. You right. know, just to, because I would imagine that would make them angrier than and if I came back they with anger. Come back with. Nope. You yeah. gave them love. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Kill them with kindness. Well, that's great. So yeah, you had dates. I was gonna promote your dates, but they. I mean, I'm, I'm keeping the ones for the rest of the year. Yeah. So I will be going to Buffalo still in Lexington. Okay. And. uh Oh my You're gosh. gonna go to Buffalo, October 27, 28. That's at Helium, I think. Yep, yep. Fun club. Chicago, November third. Uh, the Dick. Providence, the Comedy Connection, November seventeenth and eighteenth. That's one of the first clubs I ever worked oh, in really? my life. Oh, yeah. really? I love that room. It's a great room. Mm-hmm. Everyone's just right there. Right there. It used yeah. to be a bank, I think. Oh, that building. 
It used to be a oh, bank. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. But East Providence has become a very cool area. It used to be a fucking dump when I started there, but now <laughs> it's very cool. Uh, Lexington, Kentucky, comedy off Broadway, December 1st and 2nd. Great dude that runs mm. that club. Why am I forgetting his name? Um, I haven't been there in years. I haven't been there since the guy who owned it who died years ago. Oh, okay. No, this, there. this guy's still alive. Uh, Virginia Beach, December 15, 16, and in Hawaii at the Blue Note, January 27th, if you want to get tickets. You're going to go to Dan Cummins. C-U-M, like come. <laughs> Min's like in men. Like in min's. Like men. <laughs> it's almost like come in, come in uh, and get tickets. And I, here's a part of the show where I like to ask my comedian guests. It's yeah. called Fast Dogs with Fitz. Okay. We're okay. going to ask you the same questions I ask every comedian that comes on the show. Have a little sip of coffee. Okay. Clear your throat. <clears throat> sit up straight. <laughs> Look at you. What a man. Such a man in the studio. This guy's just, it's like he could beat the shit out of me if he wanted to. Do you work out? I do. What do yeah, you do? I just lift weights mostly. Yeah, yeah, like old home, school. You have home uh, gym. No, I go down to this gym down the street and just do all the the old classics I was doing since I was twenty. Yeah, like squat, same bench. with me. Eh, right. It's all the same stuff. I, it, I I just it's like a little ritual. Yep. Yep. I just put my listen to heavy metal, do that, and it just feels like a good de stressor. Right. I gotta do cardio though. My cardio is. You don't do cardio. No, Dude. I was for a while, and I stopped, and it's like. I'm so out of shape. Like it's that weird. Like you're strong, but out of shape. Oh yeah. The cardio is for my head. If I do cardio, I I fucking calm down. I feel Mm. better about myself. Yeah. I got to get back into that. Get back into the cardio. What did you do for cardio? Uh, actually the, the most fun cardio I have, I got this home thing called fight camp Uh and it's just like, um, it's like a boxing workout. You just got this big heavy bag, but more it's like, I don't know, maybe more like CrossFit or something. You know, for 30 seconds, you're punching as fast as you can this way. And then it kind of tracks how hard you're hitting and stuff. You're trying to like beat your previous time. So it's a little competitive. Yeah. And then it'll be like, okay, now do 10 burpees. You have, there's some trainer on an app that you're listening oh, wow. to. And I would sweat so much. Oh no shit. When I lived here in LA, I was doing Krav Maga and I would have to bring two shirts to the little one hour workout yeah. because I sweat so much yeah. that the, it would be like completely like dripping, completely soaked. But I was like, man, the best cardio workout ever. Yeah. Cause, Cause I can't like running and stuff. I get so bored and I, no Krav Maga. I, I did Krav Maga for a while. It's the best. And it just feels so like, I don't know. We, the, our guy used to bring out knives, like, Oh, whoa. You know, the rubber knives and stuff, oh, but oh, to teach yeah, you, yeah, 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 yeah. teach you like uh, street combat. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah, we we I think I was at the one on Olympic here actually in San Oh, Monica. that's the original. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it was cool. I I I only got like the first little belt. I did it for like a year or something. Uh huh. And we didn't really do like any of the the knives. Something maybe a demonstration or two. But I liked that it was, you know, it was all body types. Yeah. Huge age range. Uh huh. Women and men, and and such a practical thing. There was this one female instructor. She must have been. I'm guessing between 55 and 60, average size. And I remember, you know, they put you in little like bag workouts and you spar with somebody. Yeah. And I wouldn't like typically like as a, I'm a decent sized guy, like going against a woman because I feel like I have to like hold back. Yeah. And it wasn't as exciting. She kicked the shit out of me. No shit. She could punch and kick so fucking hard. It was unbelievable. Really? Like in a street fight. Yeah. hundred percent, a hundred out of a hundred times, she would annihilate me. Yeah. I need my, I'm trying to dying to get my daughter into it she's I'm trying uh, to get mine too yeah i mean i Wouldn't just feel like even if you take it for a year just yeah. to know the fundamentals yeah. of footwork and oh. not turning away or, yep. you know knowing crap my god the first thing they teach you is if you can run run yep. yep you know they never tell you to engage as a first uh option and i love that philosophy of soft tissue attack they would yep. talk about that where it's like doesn't matter if you're a 90 pound woman and there's this guy who's 280 pounds of muscle right his balls aren't 280 pounds of muscle that's right you know, his the outside throat. of his leg, yep. right? The sides go of the for neck. the knee, the yep. joints, right. you know, go those things. It's like all that strength is then useless. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to try to get her. She did this thing uh, a couple of weeks ago. She came home and she was all sweaty, her and her two <laughs> friends. And uh, we live in Venice and they had yeah. some kind of like a fight club thing for women. Whoa. And it was like they each, she showed me video and she put on a big head, head, you know, gear 
and yeah. big gloves, probably, what do they call them, 15 ounce? Are those yeah, the big the 15, ones? Yeah, 15, 16, I can't remember, 15, yeah, 16 like ounce. 15 yeah. ounce gloves, and they went in and they just fucking went three rounds against these other girls. And That's awesome. One of my 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 daughter's friends had $100 in her pocket. She won the, she won the whole thing. <laughs> That's but so she's great. like, I think I get it now. She's like, I think I want to yeah. do it. I would love it if she did it. Yeah, that technique stuff. I, we did a backyard tournament one time when I was growing up. I knew nothing. Yeah. No fighting technique. One kid, he was the smallest. This kid, Justin Swift, over, way smaller than the rest of us. But his dad boxed. Yeah. And his dad taught him how to box. And I had some friends of mine who were like big, 6'3", 200 something. He's probably 5'6", and 110 pounds worked all of us no like shit all, we all left with headaches wow nosebleeds i think he broke one of my friend's noses damn and couldn't touch him because it's just amazing technique yeah yeah right um all right it, here's your first one we're gonna yeah. ask you is uh who's the worst opener you've ever had on the road oh god the worst opener i can't remember his name okay but it, i watched somebody's career i think die on stage <laughs> <laughs> it was a triple run. Bar gigs yeah. in the Northwest. If people Oof. people that know comedy know what a triple run is, there are a series of one nighters in the Pacific Northwest where you drive, you stay in motels, yeah. and you die a horrible death every yeah. night in a horribly They're set nightmare up club. gigs. Yeah. They're nightmare gigs. And this was one where uh, I met him in, it was when Natchee, Washington was the first night, and it was notoriously bad even for those gigs. Yeah. It was like, you know, they wouldn't turn the TVs off in the place. You're not even on a stage. You're on like a little like bigger than a milk crate, but just a small like plywood platform by the darts. There's people playing pool 10 feet away from you. They don't care that you're there Yeah. in this hotel bar. And he was doing prop comedy and he had his little suitcase and, <laughs> and he'd do a half hour <laughs> cold at the opener and an hour as the headliner. So he does a half an hour. To literally no laughs, nothing, no response, like wow. like he's not even there. And you can tell, you know, it's really bothering, but he doesn't break. He doesn't like talk, address things. He's like, this is my half an hour and this is how I do it. Yeah. Next night, <laughs> we're in Lewiston, <laughs> Idaho, and it was an even rougher gig. It was one where they would Are show Are you driving up. together? No, we did drive yeah. separate. would have okay. been better if we were driving together. Yeah. We drive separate and it's this place, uh, another hotel bar, and I will say this one- been around for years, was always packed. They would pay attention, but if they didn't like you, then they would mock you. They would yeah. like, it would get real Thunderdome. Real, yeah, and, uh, yeah. So I watch, I watch him go up and he does about seven or eight minutes and people are snickering. People are not enjoying it. It was kind of corny prop comedy. And I'll never forget this little sequence where he just stopped in the middle of one of his things and he looked around like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? And doesn't say anything. And just quietly puts all his props back in his little briefcase, shuts it, locks it. <laughs> he just walks off stage, <laughs> walks past me, walks out into the parking lot. Never heard of him again. <laughs> I didn't think that was it for him. They destroyed him. <laughs> oh, if only they could know the power they held. Yeah. They ended a career that night. Yep. Just by, I, yeah. just by fucking... <laughs> Let them feel what they were feeling. I hope wow. he's doing something now wherever in the world that he brings uh, him joy. But oof. That's amazing. Poor bastard. <laughs> I wish you knew his name so we could look I him know. up right now. I wish I, wish I could remember his name. Uh, All right. Here's God. the next one. There's two types of people in the world. Okay. Go. Oof. Uh, two types of people in the world. There are, uh, oh my God. <laughs> That's really. <tough. laughs> I'm struggling with that That's one. It's a good question, right? Yeah, there's two types of people in the world. Um, okay, I'll just uh, a little silly, but there are people who openly believe in ghosts, and then there are people who say they don't, but still wouldn't play a Ouija <laughs> board in their basement at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody believes a little bit in scary stuff. Dude, if you asked me to do a Ouija board in an attic of like an old Victorian yeah. house, I wouldn't fucking do it. Me either. I don't believe in it, and I wouldn't do it. You know, because I, I- That's I, interesting. Yeah, because I, I was thinking about this. I was uh, Jim and Sam that, you know, was sure. doing their- And they were kind of fixating on this horror podcast. It was fun. We were talking about horror stuff. 
and Jim uh, Norton, you know, was eventually like, he goes, now, do you actually believe in this stuff? You know, and very much like you could tell, like, he didn't believe in this stuff. Yeah. And he said that. And I'm like, you know, I, I didn't when I started. Now I'm, I, I do think there's stuff out there that we can't explain. I'm not going to try and tell you what the rules are or anything. I just think there's some stuff outside of science in that paranormal space. And he was like, ah, I don't know. And I, and I asked him that. I'm like, okay, so you definitely don't believe. And he's like, no. And I'm like, would you go into some supposedly haunted house's basement, sit in a pentagram of candles with the door closed, just you, you got a Ouija board, and do some ritual that invokes demons to take? And he was like, no. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. and a party you believe. Hey, the party is a little right. worried. <laughs> Gee, I mean, it's, it's, I'm also like that with, I'm, because I grew up Catholic. Like there's yeah. still certain things that like I won't I won't do certain things that are like uh like if I'm in a church, I will still yeah. cross myself when I get huh? out of the PO. Mm-hmm. I have to. I can't yeah. not. It's not OCD. It's like a real fear yeah. of retribution yeah. to going to hell. My my wife was uh grew up Catholic school, church every Sunday, all that her mom, very Catholic, and, and like the best person. Yeah. Um and yeah, she it's funny for I went to a, a wake for a friend uh, from college who passed. He was Catholic. And she came with me. And I grew up in and out of Protestant stuff, but never Catholic other than going to a Catholic college. But I don't know I don't know all the little things. Yeah. And it just blew my mind. It's been years for her. And man, she's saying all the refrains and she's doing all the little movement. Like yeah. it's just it's just in her forever. Right, right, right. Just all those things. Yeah. And and I'm somebody I'm very respectful in churches. I'm not religious, but I believe in God. Yeah. I just don't know what God is. Right. I believe that something started that big bang that we can't mm-hmm. understand yeah or, i'm with or, you there's something in that what is it the uh in the black hole the um oh my god new there's, jersey <laughs> there's a term for oh i can't think what it's called now but it's like if you were to make it to the center of a black hole all concepts of time oh, negative, and space negative breaks matter? down it's uh the something time the, space continuum yeah it's it's ah shit i can't but it but it's like it's like a very magical concept where basically like the intense I love the gravity. one thing that you believe in you can't think of. I know, I know. It's, <laughs> oh, and I'll think of it as soon as I leave here, of course. Yeah. But it is like where the closer you get to the center of this black hole, the more time breaks down. So there's this, you know, theory that essentially like you could be timeless. Like you could be outside of any concept we understand of space and time. Right. You would be smushed. You would be spaghettified. Like you would be annihilated because yeah. of the intense gravity. But I'm like, there's these interesting science concepts where I'm like, it is science, but it also sounds pretty magical. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, to well, me, that's where God, might, you know, quote unquote, God could be. We'll always be one step behind God. You, nobody's mm. ever going to completely go. They're not going to dot dot it. the dot the I and cross the T and go. We got it. We nailed everything. Figured it all <laughs> out. The singularity. I think that's what it's called. The singularity. Okay. I believe, yeah. Good. That's your new special. <laughs> um, have you ever not finished a set on stage? Ooh, like left early? Yeah. Or been forced out early. Or been forced out early. Um, I've gotten booed off when I op- I opened up for Tommy Davidson and got booed off the stage. You did? Yeah. It was an all black crowd? Mm hmm. It was early on. It was at the uh, in Ebor at the Tampa Improv. Oh, that's his club. Yeah, it, you're it, fucking with his club. <laughs> and this was like 15 years ago, 16. Uh-huh. And it was pretty funny. I was so new to being out on the road, and I had a guitar at that time, and I would do these little songs. And I remember the first night Tommy and I worked together. It was a mixed audience. Was it was like his audience and some randoms or whatever. I killed. And he was the most complimentary. I yeah. just met him. Yeah. You know, I remember watching him on Living Color. It's like, oh, this is so Nicest great. guy. Not, yeah. yeah, he's like, oh, right. man. He's like, you come to L.A. I was living in Spokane time. He's like, come uh-huh. to L.A. He's like, you're going to have a sitcom, like, you know, blowing my head up. Yeah. The very next <laughs> the very next night, I do the same set. And they could, they hated, when I went to go get the guitar, just like, they hated the first 15 minutes I did without it so much. When I went to, it boot, people standing up, like, sit, like, get out of here, like, get the fuck off no. the stage. I tried to do the rest of my, t- then they gave me the light, I think, thankfully, to no get me off. shit. Went up to the green room. He would kind of stay in the green room. But the green room in Ebor oh, is. Third uh, floor. It's the third floor. You yeah. can't even see the stage. You're up in a room in the balcony, and then you can only take the elevator. There's right. no stairs. Right, no stairs. It's so total weird. fire trap. Yep. Yeah. Yep. He would he would do this weird thing where it's like 
he would have the MC do quite a bit of time in between because okay. he, he wanted to take his time going down. Yeah. So he was in the green room up there when I get off my stage and just started laughing <laughs> and just, <laughs> and like tapped his buddies. And he's like, this white boy tried to do his college crowd set and something like that. And it was so soul crushing for me at that time. Just a few oh, years in. Brutal. I'm like, ah, Tommy Davidson hates me. You son of a bitch. <laughs> he thought I was so good yesterday and now I'm a pile of shit. Yeah. Oh my God. And I, and I had some so college was that, shows. Did you finish the rest of the weekend? Or that was it. I did get to finish the rest of the weekend. I think they probably shortened my time. Yeah, yeah. And I definitely had some college. Oh, I had a college set where they cut me early. That was maybe the most brutal show I ever did. Where they brought me into you host. used to do a lot of college. Used to right? do a lot of colleges. Yeah. And they brought me in. It was the University of Illinois Carbondale, the Salukis, and they brought me in to host this talent competition. And they set me up for <laughs> yeah. failure. They uh -huh. didn't know they did. Yeah. But they brought me in, and it was an Apollo night, like, and I had did did not have an act like a like a Def Jam type talent competition. So I'm the only white kid in this white in this whole like I don't know probably 200 people, and they told me don't swear, you know, keep it clean, all these things. I bring up somebody who's done comedy twice maybe before, and the and the and the winner would get to go on. There was like a little judge panel, and the winner was going to get to open up for some big hip hop person at the time, and they did the filthiest set. Uh, just every word, everything, uh -huh. all the things they told me I couldn't say. Yeah. They did all, and murder. And now the audience knows what they like uh -huh. and what they don't like. Right. And then they bring me back up and they hate my guts. I I bring another person up, even dirtier than the first one, like, I don't know, five minutes about it, pussy eating, whatever, and crackheads and all these kind of like Def Jam tropes at the time. Yeah. Murder. Murder. It was their first time on stage, too. Yeah. I remember that detail stinging a little bit more. Yeah. Murder. And then... <laughs> There was supposed to be a third person. That person doesn't show up. So the person who brought me in, so was kind of like the host, I guess, this uh, student advisor or student activities board advisor, says, hey, so-and-so, is how about we bring Dan back up to while the judges formulate the votes, do another 15, 20 minutes uh -huh. in unison. And I'm in the audience amongst them. Yeah. Stand up, booing. A girl in front of me goes, nah, nah, and motions for me to, like, to my face, like, sit down. No shit. <laughs> And then, so they're like, okay, I guess we don't need Dan to come back up anymore. And I'm still hanging around there. <laughs> and at that time, they would get money, the student activities boards, they would bring you in, but they would also take you out to dinner. Take it, always Bennigan's. Right? They always yeah, take Bennigan's, you to Bennigan's. TGI Friday, yeah, that yeah. kind of shit. Uh, and I realized after a while, I'm like, oh, this isn't for me. It's so they can get a free dinner. Exactly. There. They insist on the free dinner still afterwards. Yeah. So now I have to go sit with the people oh. that just witnessed this. And I remember she, in all sincerity, she's like, what happened? She's like, you were so funny at the conference. And I'm like, that was such a different set. I'm like, you essentially just brought John Mayer in to open for DMX. Yeah. And I'm like, there's different styles of comedy. Right. You couldn't have picked a worse one. You didn't do your job. Right. I did my job. You set me up to right. be destroyed. Right. But yeah, that was wow. the most the crowds hated me. Oh. All right. Finally. What is Dan Cummins the hackiest bit you've ever done? <laughs> uh, oh, I, I do remember. It was, oh, how did the joke go? It was, there was those Geico commercials. I think it was Geico. Uh, you know, I just saved a ton of money on my car insurance by insert like so many things. Uh -huh. And I, <laughs> I didn't realize, I do blame like, Doing comedy in an isolated area. I, I wasn't aware of what other people were doing. Uh -huh. And I did this joke on like uh, my first Comedy Central, like live at Gotham and then like some Ferguson thing. And I think also did it on Last Comic Standing. And I want to say it ended up in a compilation somewhere of people doing the same joke, essentially. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but it was this joke of I just saved a ton of money on my car insurance by fleeing the scene of the accident. It was like my, and uh, I, th and it would murder in uh, these little road rooms. And I'm like, yeah. oh, that's so clever. Yeah. And yeah, fucking, it wasn't clever. A hundred <laughs> other comics were doing the same fucking joke. <laughs> and once it was pointed out to me, I'd already like thrown it on all these shows. Oh, and I'm like, ah, that's shit. That's amazing. Yeah. Dude, that needs to be a show on Comedy Central. Just showing everybody oh. doing the same bits. Yeah. They used to do that on Comic View, I believe it was. Oh, really? It, it, yeah, it was Comic View. And I remember thinking, like, so funny, but also, oh, how embarrassing. If you're one of the comics, it's like they would do, like, a setup, and then you'd hear, like, five different people doing the same punchline. Right, punch line. And I'm right. Like, Oof. 
Hey, dude, I do a joke about my proctology exam, and I don't give a shit. It's funny, and I'm <laughs> keeping it. Uh, Dan Cummins, the special is uh, it's really great. If you're oh, thanks, if you're somebody that like here's what I like about the special is really either side is yeah. going to enjoy this special. Like if you're somebody who's a conspiracy theorist, if you're somebody who's a liberal, if you're a libertarian, as you said, or mm-hmm. I think you explore it all with an even hand. I think it comes out. It's all super funny. Um, congrats on the special. Oh, thank you. And, and, and congrats on uh, lining up where you're taping yours. And uh, Yeah. So this gonna, it's going to be a monster special. That's gonna Yeah, be, I'll say hi to yeah. Matt for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're going to do a beautiful job. Yeah, everybody, everybody screams their praises. Um, trying to get better is the uh, special. He talks about the new Holocaust, which <laughs> made me laugh out loud very hard. And uh, thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me, Greg. All right, see ya.